to get to the get to the, uh, the presentation to our speaker for today. Uh, once again, I want to thank everyone for for being here and um, and looking forward to being able to do this face to face again sometime soon. But in the meantime, it sounds like we're getting a lot more comfortable being with each other on Zoom from the sounds of the last few minutes, which is which is a good thing. Um, I would like to introduce uh, this week's uh, this week's uh, speaker, who's uh, Dr. Mizibanzi Bismarck Kiabeka from um, who's the, the Minister of Energy as the Chief Executive Officer for the National Nuclear Regulatory of South Africa, where we held that position since, since uh, 2013. Uh, his nuclear career spans 19 years, starting as a reactor physicist at ESCOM Enterprises, which is the South African electricity utility company, and moving through roles both at ESCOM and, um, and then also at PBMR uh, Utility uh, Limited. Um, he moved on to IAEA, where he was um, the nuclear engineer and unit head for gas-cooled reactors. Um, and while there, was also involved in the team that advises member states in the development of new nuclear power programs. And was involved with countries in Africa, Southeast Asia, Europe, and Latin America. He's also been a visiting scholar at the Nuclear Research and Consultancy Group in the Netherlands in the International Research and in, in, as an International Research Associate at Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, he's held many high profile national and international leadership roles. He's the chairperson of the Council of the Northwest University, which is the second largest university in South Africa. He's previously served as a member of the University Council, including being a chairperson of Northwest University's Council's Transformation Oversight Committee and Executive Committee of Council since November of 2014. He's a member of the, he is a member of the International Nuclear Safety Advisory Group, appointed by the IAEA Director General, and serves as Chairman of the Regulatory Cooperation Forum under the auspices of the IAEA. He's also a member of the IAEA's Technical Working Group, a Nuclear Knowledge Manager. In 2017, he was elected president of the sixth review meeting of contracting parties to the Convention on the Safety of Spent Nuclear Fuel Management and Safety of Radioactive Waste Management, and was recently appointed by the Minister of Trade and Industry as member of the South African Council for Nonproliferation of Weapons of Mass Destruction. Dr. Tibeka holds a master's degree PhD in nuclear engineering, both from Penn State University and a master's degree in applied radiation science and technology from Northwest University in South Africa, as well as a master's degree in management specializing in project management from Colorado Technical University in the United States, and a bachelor's degree in physics and chemistry from Northwest University in South Africa. And I hope that after having uh, uh, read through this very impressive uh, lifetime work in the field that I've given him enough time to give a, his presentation. Um, but at this point, uh, welcome to welcome virtually to North Carolina State University. And, um, and I hand the microphone over to you for your presentation. Thank you for being here. Thanks very much, Shannon and uh, uh, Steve. And uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Professor Ivanov and the colleagues for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. I was uh, under the impression that I had one and a half hour. Turns out I have one hour. So I'm going to quickly breeze through some of the slides. But the focus here will be to really give you a, a flavor of current status and future of nuclear energy in South Africa and dedicating some time to the role of the National Nuclear Regulator, which I had, uh, as uh, Steve has said. Next slide, please. So this is the landscape. Um, oh, all right. So let's start with this one. It is important to understand what uh, the, the, the nuclear space in South Africa looks like and who are the role players. So you can see that uh, at the top, you have the Department of Minerals, Resources and Energy, 
which is the government department that houses all nuclear activities. Then you have the South African Nuclear Energy Corporation, NEXA, which is responsible for research and development on nuclear technologies and nuclear energy. You have Nuclear Fuels Corporation, which is, as the name suggests, responsible for the manufacturing of uh, fuel. And um, then you have the National Nuclear Regulator, which is ourselves re responsible for the regulation. Then you have the Radioactive Waste Disposal Institute for waste management, back end fuels of the, of the fuel cycle. And uh, finally, you have the ESCOM, which is the Quebec Nuclear Power Plant for nuclear energy generation. Next, please. In the slide, again, you can see how these, uh, these uh, facilities are spread across the country. Um, on the bottom left is the, the Quebec nuclear site where we have two nuclear units of 900 megawatts French design uh, 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 situated about uh, 20, about 40 kilometers uh, west of Cape Town. And um, in the Northern Cape, the next, uh, 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 the next uh, facility will be the Falpers disposal site in a semi-desert area towards the border with Nam Namibia. And up north, you can see the Nexa site, which is our research uh, facility, as you call them in the United States, the research laboratories, um, where this is where our research reactor is uh, operated from. Next. Now, breaking down those role players that um, I have shown in the previous slides, we start with nuclear policy, which is housed by the at the Department of Mineral, Regula Mineral, Mineral and Energy. Now, the department uh, drives the nuclear, South African nuclear policy of 2008, which provides the framework for prospecting, milling, mining, the use of nuclear materials, development, utilization of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. And the government, through this policy, aims to attain global leadership and self-sufficiency in the nuclear energy sector and to contribute to the country's national program of social and economic transformation and improve the quality of life to support the advancements of science and technology through the peaceful uses of nuclear technology and nuclear energy. Next. Now, I have requested uh, Nexa to provide some slides here so that I can uh, uh, not, I can try not to misrepresent them. So this would be the slides that I received from Nexa. Their mandate is to promote research and development in the field of nuclear energy and radiation sciences. They process source material for special nuclear materials, restricted material and to reprocess and enrich source material and nuclear materials where necessary. And they also cooperate with any person and institutions in matters falling within these functions mentioned. Next. Now, NEXA also through its subsidiary are the biggest producers of radioisotopes using uh, their subsidiary called the NTP. They produce and deliver nuclear medicine to more than 60 countries around the world. And um, they generate a revenue of about 1 billion rands in 2013, for example, which is about 95 million US dollars. Next. Um, they routinely service, serve uh, customers with a range of radiation-based products and services. And as I said, they are the, one of the world's leading producers of radiochemicals, radiopharmaceuticals, and other radiation technology-based products. Next. Molybdenum-99 and uh, iodine-131 are some of the radiochemicals that NEXA produces. They also have, they are the biggest exporter of radio, radioactive sources throughout the African continent and some countries in Europe and Asia. And um, they provide irradiation services for neutron transportation, doping of silicon, neutron irradiation service, gamma irradiation services. And uh, on, on the radio pharmaceutical side, you can see that they have technetium 99 generators and uh, other products, uh, IR, uh, 
iridium 192 for brachytherapy. Next. Now, this is a picture that shows you our very old and efficient Safari 1 research reactor based at Nexa. It is a 20 megawatts uh, trigger, uh, trigger uh, research reactor, which was, uh, I think, uh, built by the United States many years ago. It is currently, I think, about 60, 65 years old almost. So you can tell uh, it is quite an old facility. It is the most utilized reactor in, um, in the African continent, research reactor in the African continent, and uh, probably the top five most utilized reactor in the world. Next. <coughs> so we, we move on to talk about the, the nuclear energy space. Uh, South Africa, next. Now, South Africa has got, um, in the whole continent, is the only country that operates nuclear power plants. So we have a site at Quebec. That's the picture you can see there. It's got two three-loop PWRs. One was commissioned in 1984 and one was commissioned in 1985. They operate on 15 to 18 month uh, cycles and they have two licensed fuel suppliers, high density fuel racks installed in the late 90s for additional on-site fuel storage capacity. And during the re-racking, some, some fuel assemblies were placed in casks, which is one of the projects I will talk about. And a large area of the Quebec site has been proclaimed as a nature reserve with access available to the public. So whenever you find yourself in South Africa, you must try and visit this area. It is one of the scenic areas to visit uh, when you are in the Cape Town area. Next. So it was designed with a 40 year plant life and uh, we are currently in the process of extending it by an additional 20 years. It's a PWR Westinghouse design and constructed by Framatome. And uh, the construction commenced in 1976 and the first operation, commercial operation in 1984 for unit one and 1985 for unit two. As I said again, the 930 megawatts, three loop PWRs, 157 fuel assemblies, and reached to 4.4%, and the thermal power of 2,775 megawatts thermal. And it has operated safely for about 36 years now, and there has never been any uh, reportable major incident. Next. So, heavens spoken about the current situation, it's time to talk about the future. The future, we are looking at a Quebec <clears throat> long-term operation that should uh, currently, the life of Quebec must end at, in 2024. 20, Therefore, there is a need to extend the life by another 20 years, and that process is ongoing. The country is looking at the new nuclear build of 2,500 megawatts to be procured by 2024 also. And there is a plan, as I said earlier, you have an old aging nuclear, uh, nuclear research reactor. There's a plan to uh, re uh, replace this reactor with a new multi-purpose reactor procured by 2024 also. And there is also a plan to <clears throat> license a central interim storage facility which also has to be procured by 2024. You can imagine now that 2024 is the magic uh, year for the nuclear space in South Africa. Next. Now, talking about the new build, South Africa has a, a so-called integrated resource plan. Now, this is a plan that government puts in place and, and, and takes through the approval processes within the bureaucracy and up to cabinet and approved by parliament uh, through public consultation. Now the plan basically <clears throat> maps out what the, the, the mix, the energy mix for the country would be in the foreseeable future, normally projected for 10 years, but the plan of course is, is revised every two to five years. Now the one that was approved in October, 2019, 
made a determination that Quebec power plant design must be extended by another 20 years by undertaking the necessary technical and regulatory work. And also that uh, the, the, the government must commence preparation for a nuclear build program to the extent of 2000 megawatts uh, thermal, I mean megawatts uh, at a pace and scale that the country can afford because it is a no regret option in the long term. It is important to add at this point in time that these 2000 megawatts thermal was also um, uh, meant to not exclude. It's, it's not prescribed what kind of technologies, but also the small modular reactors have actually been given an option or space to occupy in these 2000 megawatts uh, um, share of the IRP. Next. So with all these big nuclear projects and the magic number of magic year of 2024, one would wonder what is the role of the national nuclear regulator. Now, it is important again to highlight the fact that South Africa is not new in the nuclear and the atomic energy space. The Nuclear and Atomic Energy Administration and Research and Development in South Africa started as way back as in 1948. But the most important thing in these years, I'm not going to be going through each of them. It is important to know that like many countries, um, the, nation, the, the, the regulatory body of our country was born out of the operating uh, of the promotional side of uh, nuclear. But uh, it was realized with time and in the evolution of time when you started having three mile islands and you, you had the, the, the Chernobyl accident, it was realized that you needed to separate promotional activities of uh, the nuclear uh, uh, energy from the regulatory ones. That is why therefore in 19, uh, 99, you had the new legislation that uh, determined an independent nuclear regulatory body that was called the National Nuclear Regulator. Next. Now, the birth of this uh, regulator that I, I proudly had is born out of a number of international conventions that South Africa is a signatory to. Most importantly for purposes of this presentation is the Convention on Nuclear Safety, uh, which uh, as you would know is uh, one of the governing safety conventions globally uh, by the IAEA. And it determines that government shall, uh, uh, member states or signatory parties of this convention shall designate an independent regulatory body that would be the licensing and authorization uh, uh, custodian of uh, nuclear activities in, in the member state. So our, our, our government therefore followed in its uh, 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 obligations under the Convention of Nuclear Safety to establish the national nuclear regulator that I am currently the head of. Next. The scope of regulatory control, we are as the NNR um, responsible for the entire scope of regulation starting the, the whole uh, life cycle of a nuclear facility starting from site from siting of that facility until of course the decommissioning of that facility. We are also responsible for uh, authoriz authorization of vessels that are prop propelled by nuclear power or that, that or, or any vessel that carries radioactive material on board. And for example, if you would have Russian submarines for whatever reasons docking in the Cape Town port, they would need uh, permission for, from uh, our, our regulator. <clears throat> Next. This, just one back, yes. This is the structure of the regulator. You have about 177 staff members, more, and more than 80% of these staff members uh, are postgraduate uh, degree holders in science and engineering disciplines. Our headquarters is in Centurion near Pretoria, and our site office is in Cape Town, which is responsible for the nuclear power plant. And you can see the structure 
of uh, the executive management there. Next. <clears throat> now the regulatory process, um, for those who are not familiar with the field, how do we regulate? We have the responsibility first to develop regulatory standards and documents or to which then the, any applicants will have to use and satisfy the requirements that we set out in these regulatory documents. After having proven that they satisfy our requirements, we authorize them, in other words, give them the necessary licenses and permits to practice any radioactive uh, radiation uh, or, or nuclear in, in inclined activities. We have a duty again to carry out regular reviews and assessments for things such as design modifications or design changes and so on. We have also the responsibility to inspect, to ensure that they comply with the, the conditions of authorizations or conditions of licenses. In the case when they don't, then we have the duty to enforce uh, such uh, <coughs> measures to ensure that they comply. Next. Our regulatory framework, oops, back again. Our regulatory framework is very simple. The pyramid you can see you have at the top of everything, the act that established the regulator and its regulations. And then you have nuclear authorizations and licenses at level one. You have regulatory directives and regulatory policies. Level two, you have guides, documents, uh, regulatory guides and position papers. And level three, you have other a document such as technical report and inspection report and so on. Next. We are also responsible for one back, please. We're also responsible for emergency planning, preparedness and response. In other words, as a condition of license, each licensee must develop and maintain an emergency preparedness plan that meets comprehensive requirements from the National Nuclear Regulator. And we regularly uh, have full-scale nuclear regulatory emergency exercises that we conduct to evaluate the integrated capabilities of various responders, agencies, and role players during a radiological emergency. In these exercises, we, we get observers uh, to come and observe how the uh, license holder will have fared in as far as um, satisfying our requirements as set out in the regulations for emergency preparedness and response. Next. We're also responsible for nuclear security. So we license facilities to comply with uh, adequacy and effective effectiveness or effective physical protection uh, requirements and nuclear security arrangements at those facilities. So we develop regulatory requirements in accordance with national and international legal instruments. And we do conduct nuclear security compliance assurance activities in the form of nuclear security inspections at these facilities. Next. So this is just to show you the facilities that we regulate. That is the power plant in Quebec. Next. And that would be our very, very complex uh, nuclear research center in um, Pelindaba, just 21 kilometers west of Pretoria. Costadin has been there with Maria several times. They had next, this is what, is what is called Nexa. Also a very scenic area with a very beautiful heart view of the heart of the sport dam in the background. Next. And we obviously, South Africa is endowed with minerals one of those is, ma is gold mining. And as you know, gold, gold mining results in a lot of uh, radioactive uh, material uh, at the end of the extraction process, in particular uranium. In fact, my guys that regulate these mining facilities, they, they tell me that it, we mine uh, more uranium than gold. We, what, you, what you leave behind, you, what you take away as gold, you leave much behind as uh, uh, the byproduct, the uranium. So we need to uh, regulate these facilities and ensure that uh, at the end of the extraction processes, the radioactive material is well safeguarded and also uh, the workers are also protected from un undue radiation exposure. Next. 
And we also have a waste disposal facility called the Falkwoods, which we also regulate. And this is just pictures of the, 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 the trenches where these uh, radioactive waste drums uh, are kept. Next. Now, how do we try to stay ahead of the game as the regulator? We try to do that through espousing what uh, is popularly known as the principles of an effective nuclear regulator. And this was published by the OECD NEA uh, some years ago in 2014. And four important principles define what an effective nuclear regulator is. First, it must be primarily focused on safety. It must be independent. It must pro pro possess the requisite competency in its staff. And most importantly, it must be open and transparent. Next. Now, what does independence mean? It means that um, it, it must not be susceptible to um, political influence. There must be legislation that ensures that there is no interference with regulatory decisions. There must be legislation that ensures that you have the power to enforce your regulatory decisions. The regulator must advise government on any matters related to nuclear safety. And then the regulator must have provision for financial resources allocated to it through parliamentary appropriations, fees for, nu fees for nuclear authorizations. And of course, it must be assured of uh, funding in a way that allows it uh, to, to plan ahead, in other words, predictable funding. Next. It, it must also, government must also uh, make sure that the regulator has all the requisite competencies and that it does not rely on a few individuals as decision makers. And there must be clear procedures and criteria for appointments for, to decision making positions and that the regulator must have access to external expertise by way of technical support organizations. Next. As far as openness is concerned, just one back, please. It, it obviously we have an obligation to disclose information. We must involve stakeholders. We must involve stakeholders in relevant decision-making processes through public participation mechanisms. And we have an obligation to be transparent but we must respect, of course, uh, commercially sensitive information and physical protection of nuclear materials. So in other words, nuclear security information must be, uh, we must be transparent, but we must take cognizance of some of such uh, sensitive information. Next. Again. So we, we try to um, <coughs> demonstrate that we are an effective, regulatory body through a number of ways. Now, one of the ways that we've done this is through international peer reviews. The IAEA has got what it calls, what it calls the integrated regulatory reviews, uh, uh, regulatory review um, mission, the IRRS mission, which um, we held in 2016. December 2016 in South Africa, and you can see the pictures there. Interestingly, it was led by <coughs> Victor McCree, who was at that time the executive director of the USNRC. Now, from this uh, exercise, which was conducted by 29 experts from 19 IAEA uh, member states, it came out that um, the, the South African National Nuclear Regulator is an effective regulator. That was that was the outcome of the mission. And of course, there were, there were findings or recommendations that we needed to follow through and we're in the process of uh, implementing those uh, 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 recommendations from our, our peers. Next. We also take credit uh, in, participation, in, in, in participating in a number of international cooperation forums we are a member of the Forum for Nuclear Regulatory Bodies in Africa. Uh, just until recently, I was the deputy chairperson of this structure. And uh, we provide a lot of uh, support to a number of thematic working groups for this uh, body, the FNRBA, mostly relating to nuclear power plant licensing, nuclear transport safety, as well as emergency preparedness and response. Next. 
We also, as part of demonstrating our effectiveness, have our own independent laboratory, NNR laboratory, which is there to provide uh, radio analy anal analytical support for decision making uh, in the in the verification and research purposes for the regulator. Next, we have this this laboratory is uh, as you can see. Um, equipped with quite a number of uh, state-of-the-art uh, equipment, the alpha spectrometry. Uh, uh, next. The liquid scintillation counter, next. The gross alpha beta counting system, next, please. Yes, so we, we can do our own uh, analysis independently when we, for example, do environmental sampling uh, around nuclear facilities and we take these samples and go and test them in our, in our uh, laboratory and then compare with uh, the licensees uh, <coughs> results. We also are a bilateral uh, partner with a number of uh, leading uh, international uh, regulators such as the Chinese regulator, such as the Finnish, the Polish, the Russian, the United Kingdom, the United States. <clears throat> and meanwhile, we also just recently signed with Australia and Belgium. So we are an international player in the nuclear space of uh, nuclear safety and regulation. Next. So one of the things that we try to check and to expose what we do to international scrutiny is um, what we call the Nuclear Regulator Information Conference. Now, this was an idea that we uh, adapted from the US NRC RIC, the Regulatory Information Conference, and it brings together a lot of uh, industry players, policymakers, locally and internationally. And our first was in 2016. Um, and you can see the picture of all the speakers that were present there virtually from across the globe. Next. And um, as part of this, we, we get industry to come and talk to, we have an outreach pro program where industry comes and talk to university students and, univers and the high school students. Uh, <coughs> to talk about nuclear careers. So it is a very, very popular um, session, which we have, uh, in fact, uh, ded we, which we dedicate one full day for students to come and interact with the nuclear industry. You can see from the pictures we had industry players from designers to vendors to uh, <coughs> utility companies from the Russian Federation, from France, from China and so on. Next. And we had, <coughs> so we do it by, uh, sorry, uh, biannually. So the first one was in 2016 and the next one was in 2018. Now you can see that the, the numbers have grown so much, it is becoming a very, very popular conference that we conceived since 2016. Unfortunately, due to the COVID, we're supposed to have. <coughs> the third one this year in 2020, October, in fact, next month, but that will unfortunately have to be rescheduled. Next. So one of the facilities that we think is important to show, to demonstrate our effectiveness is the Regulatory Emergency <coughs> Response Center, which is housed at the headquarters this is the, the center that is uh, there to respond to notification of nuclear radiological emergencies from nuclear authorization holders. And it took us five years to get this fully operational. And it is very important because it helps us to uh, notify and activate uh, regulatory response uh, and also direct communication with facilities and emergency control centers and disaster management center. It is a very, very, uh, technologically advanced and very integrated communication systems. We get the radiological instrumentation for environmental monitoring. In other words, we can get online 
radiation mon monitoring from site and around facilities directly into our center at uh, <coughs> in Centurion uh, at our headquarters through the, our uh, plant data transfer facilities. Next. Yes, this is what I was talking about. We can be able to access, to access live plant data and for monitoring and independent verif verification and we can actually replicate data from the databases. We have the online radiation monitoring <coughs> services in uh, many, I mean, closer to nuclear facilities in South Africa. And uh, so we can get live radiation doses, for example, as the accident evolves. And we can, in, in, in that regard, be able to advise government on what actions to take. Next. Uh, next. So one of our flagship projects is what we call the Center for Nuclear Safety and Security. Again, this was uh, launched in 2016. It is a, a center um, that is meant to develop a pipeline of skills for the regulator, homegrown skills, we say, because you cannot get a regulator uh, 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 directly from a uh, uh, university. You need to mold a graduate into a regulator. So we thought it is important to establish our own center so that we, we, we build our own uh, regulatory staff from, from junior until they are experts. <clears throat> so next. This center is uh, rested on three pillars. Education and training is most important because that's where now we will train our staff and also uh, uh, issue qualifications in the nuclear in nuclear safety and also we um, conduct research and development uh, through a number of projects that will enable us to perform research in areas that needs deeper understanding before to support regulatory decision making we also aim to use this center as part of our consulting or so-called technical support services in the case where, for example, we can augment the revenue for the regulator by conducting consultancies for regulators in the African continent. Now, uh, the educational and training space, for example, is uh, supported by a number of partners. We have international partners in this regard and local universities. The NCSU is one such partner that uh, is our is uh, is uh, has signed a partnership agreement with us as part of the CNSS. And as uh, Professor Ivanov have said earlier, we have students that are based at the at the NCSU. Next, currently we have this research funding agreement that is going on between us and the NCSU a multi-physics platform for safety analysis based on NRC code. And we're looking at improved estimates of local safety parameters for efficient evaluation of realistic safety margins for real size reactor core modeling. That is the project title that Professor Ivanov and uh, our uh, CNSS staff uh, are working on. Next. Um, what we are looking at as uh, expected benefits from this project is really to get uh, to perform independent safety analysis verification calculations for the Quebec um, for the first time because we haven't had that capability. We want to be able to quantify Quebec reactor safety margins. We want to be able to provide training and to develop high level expertise locally. And um, the deliverables that Professor Ivanov and his team are going to give us in this is to give us reliable software capacity based on high fidelity multi-physics efficient methodologies for safety analysis of current and future light water reactors and to also be able to assess uncertainties to quantify safety margins and uh, to go beyond the current state of the art since we will have uh, an integrated safety analysis and uncertainty assessment methodologies in an efficient manner. Next. Now, my team tell me that um, they are very happy with the collaboration. We see a lot of uh, synergies between us and, and NCSU. 
Uh, we have the most successful and productive international uh, collaboration with them to date. As I said earlier, we had two South African students currently attending um, MS courses at NCSU. And we have two more postgraduate students that we anticipate to send to NS NCSU soon. And um, we also like the NCSU distant planning program, which we think will benefit local training and development needs through capacity building initiatives at the CNSS for its education and training pillar. And yeah, we wish that this collaborative research work can be long -term, a long-term venture for the mutual benefit of our two institutions. Next. So quickly, what are the current major regulatory projects that the regulator is seized with? One is the replacement of the steam generator steam generators at Quebec, it's a massive project um, that, uh, that is currently ongoing and it is part of the long-term operation project of the Quebec nuclear power plant. Also the replacement of the unit two reactor pressure vessel head, the licensing of spent fuel casks and interim storage facility, the replacement of refueling water storage tanks at the Quebec nuclear power plant. Next. Those are the pictures. You can see that uh, one of the steam generators there is com is com has been completed. In fact, uh, because of COVID, we had a delay of the shipment of the steam generators, but uh, I think in a week's or one and, one and a half week's time, the steam generators will be, ar will be arriving in South Africa. They were supposed to have been shipped for March, uh, but that has been, since been delayed. But yeah, currently as we speak, sailing in the, on the sea and route to South Africa, to Cape Town. Next. The reactor pressure vessel heads and the control rod drive mechanisms are also going to be a big project that uh, is, going, is, 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 is going to be part of the long-term operation of the Quebec nuclear power plant that we need to license as the regulator. Next. And uh, the spent fuel dry storage casks is one such project. Just to give background here, the, the nuclear power plant in Quebec's uh, pools are almost full. They have been re-wrecked to allow for more, uh, 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 more uh, capacity of the, of, the, of the pools. But of course, you know that you have now criticality risks problems in such a situation. So some of these uh, uh, spent fuel uh, assemblies have now been placed into the dry storage in, 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 in those uh, casks. We have, of course, to license that process. The casks themselves have to be licensed and the, the whole re-wrecking process has to be licensed. Otherwise, come 2024, Quebec, even if they get the, 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 the long-term operation, they won't have any capacity to store fuel if they don't spend fuel, spend fuel if they don't uh, transfer it to dry storage. Next. Um, yeah, this is uh, just to show you some of these uh, casks that are already uh, being delivered to, to the Quebec nuclear power plant. Next. The replacement of the refueling water storage tanks has also taken place. One of them has already been completed. The replacement has been completed. They are busy with the second one. So you can tell that there is a lot of refurbishment, refurbishment uh, work that is going on in the Quebec nuclear power plant. That again must be over, the oversight of the regulator is required. And, and of course, authorization and permitting for these kinds of uh, refurbishments is, takes a lot of work on the side of the regulator because we have to assure ourselves that these are done uh, con uh, conforming to our safety uh, uh, requirements. Next. Now the challenges and emerging trends we, as the regulator, are seeing um, the fragmentation in the national regulatory framework. Now we have a system where the Department of Health, the National Department of Health, is uh, licensing radioactive sources in hospitals. And we are also licensing radioactive sources in nuclear facilities. We see that as a fragmentation and in fact, international best practice dictates that these must be housed under one regulator. 
because otherwise it becomes difficult for accountability if you have a fragmentation in the national regulatory framework. This is one of the things that was that came out of the the peer review uh, mechanism that I talked about in 2016 by the IAEA, and we are in the process of uh, looking into this and uh, getting to transfer these functions from the Department of Health into the National Nuclear Regulator. You would know from your system in the United States that all these are under one regulatory body, which is the US NRC, as opposed to having it in two regulatory bodies. We are also worried about the degradation that we see in the safety culture and the security culture at nuclear inst installations. We've had quite a number of issues, for example, with our <coughs> radioisotopes production uh, facility, the NTP, where we have seen a number of safety culture lapses that have led to us shutting down the facility for some time. And that has caused serious economic problems for Nexa itself. But we had to do what we had to do because if they are not uh, operating according to our accepted safety standards, then we need to take enforcement actions. We also have uncertainties around the nuclear uh, installation site license that process <coughs> that uh, we are currently adjudicating. ESCOM applied for a nuclear site license uh, in 2016, but ESCOM is going through uh, financial challenges and therefore we have that uncertainty as to whether we need to co continue with uh, this uh, site license given their challenges because it, it's obviously a regulatory endeavor that would need uh, a lot of money from ESCOM to pay. Environmental contamination from legacy mining uh, people came many years ago in South Africa, mined the gold and left the, the mine dams and the sludges all over the place. That is now causing a lot of environmental contamination, which is a headache for the regulator. Competency and sufficiency of skills for the future. If we have nuclear, the nuclear new build, we definitely will need more skills. And uh, <clears throat> it is not easy because we don't have, uh, like the US, a number of nuclear uh, graduate schools in the country. Next. To conclude, South Africa has a long history in nuclear technology and nuclear power, as I have already demonstrated. And uh, for that to happen, it means it, it should have had a capable, effective, and efficient and independent nuclear regulator, which is a necessary precondition for safe operation of such technologies over so many years. For 20 years, the NNR has ensured a safe and secure operation of major nuclear and radiation facilities in the country through stringent oversight. We, we offer exciting and stable career opportunities to curious scientists and engineers with a questionable, uh, sorry, a questioning, a questioning attitude. As you would know, physics, chemistry, material science, computational analysis skills, radiation protection, environmental science, civil, mechanical and engineering and metallurgy, and metallurgy are some of major areas of interest that we need in regulatory work. <coughs> Ongoing collaboration with university partners like the North Carolina State University <coughs> is really essential for a sustained pipeline of skills to the regulator in particular to support our Center for Nuclear Safety and Security. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. I think I have managed to keep to your time. Thank you very much for a very impressive talk, and all the more impressive squeezing it into into the into the into the one hour time slot. That was, that was perfect. Um, we have a couple of questions on the chat that we'll start with, and then if anyone else is interested in asking questions, please. Uh, Feel free to raise your hand and uh, I will call on you as, as moderator. But while mm -hmm. everyone's queuing up their questions there, let me ask a couple of quick questions that came up in the chat. Um, the first one comes from um, uh, Professor Rob Hayes from our department who asks, uh, he says, South Africa was one of the rare instances where a nuclear power voluntarily chose to eliminate their nuclear weapons arsenal. Could you speak on the, to this topic in regards to how and why you believe this occurred and provide any further inferences in this regard? Thank you very much. Um, uh, some people may not know, but South Africa <clears throat> many years ago was at the brink of producing a nuclear bomb. <clears throat> and this was um, 
manufactured at uh, the Nexa site in Penindaba. Now you'd recall that at that time it was um, the times when uh, uh, during the apartheid system. Now South Africa at that time was uh, isolated from the international community and therefore they needed to have a nuclear weapon as part of you know deterrence. However after the release of uh, Nelson Mandela from prison and the elections in 1994, South Africa was readmitted into the national, uh, the, the, the international space. <clears throat> and therefore, um, had to make certain assurance, give certain assurances to the international communities. One of those was accession to the, to the non-proliferation treaty. <clears throat> So upon accession to acceding to the non-proliferation treaty, South Africa decided to volunteer to dismantle its nuclear weapons program. This was largely because we believed at that point in time that there were no real threats to South Africa's sovereignty and therefore no need to invest billions in the nuclear, pro in the nuclear weapons programs. What was even more urgent at that time was to uh, put invest to invest more in social economic programs instead of a nuclear weapon. So th those were the motivating the motivate the motivations behind uh, the dismantling of the nuclear bomb project. Um, we remain a leading member of the board of governors at the IAEA, which advocates uh, atoms for peace, and uh, we believe that and uh, we have demonstrated through the the, the NTP facility at NEXA that in fact we can use nuclear technologies for human health as we do with radiopharmaceutical product productions for it more for both for for health reason for health uh, support but also it, it generates a lot of uh, revenue for the country instead of uh, spending lots of money in nuclear weapons program thank you our next question comes from Barbara Oliveira who asks, can you provide any inferences about the uranium enrichment program? The South Africa does not uh, enrich uranium. During the weapons program, South Africa developed enrichment technologies which were since abandoned at that time. And um, I believe, and I hear from government that as part of the nuclear program, at some point we're talking about 9.6 gigawatts. At that point, you would imagine that we wanted to localize a big chunk of the nuclear value chain, uh, restarting uh, the enrichment program for, for power production was also a consideration. But of course, as you know, it is a very expensive endeavor and we cannot even think of enrichment again when we're talking about a 2,500 megawatts program. So enrichment as far as I understand at this point is off the table. The next question in the chat comes from another one from um, from uh, Professor Hayes from NC State. Uh, he says it is it is comforting to see you are willing to shut down operations at a site if they do not comply with safety standards. Can you speak to how often this occurs in South Africa? Well, um, it is not very, it is not very common. I can tell you that we never had to shut down the Quebec nuclear power plant. We have issued a number of directives directing them to do certain things, but not as, uh, uh, not coming close to uh, shutting them down because the, the level of transgressions did not warrant uh, a, a shutdown, but we have shut down a number of uh, other non-power facilities. We've shut down the, the radio pharmaceutical production facility, NTP. Uh, and, and as I said here, it's, it was pure, purely based on lapses in safety culture. And it has done, it has happened uh, uh, since 2017, we probably shut them twice or three times. And we really were concerned about the degradation of the safety culture at this facility. We've shut down the facility, the, the fuel, uh, the, the radioactive waste disposal facility at some point, I think four or five years ago, again, for lapses in their, 
uh, 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 waste acceptance criteria and we had to you know shut them down to ensure that next time they, they take they to they accept waste they had uh, satisfied themselves that all the protocols have been duly satisfied thank you our next question comes from from glenn glenn l uh uh, the question is, can you predict what nuclear power plant design will be built in the near future and which companies will be responsible for this project? <laughs> we, <clears throat> our policy is very clear. Our nuclear energy policy of 2008 is very clear. It says light water reactors. So that much is a certainty. As to what technology <clears throat> it's going to be, I believe government is very open to the best uh, uh, bidder. We've had a request for information, I should have mentioned it in my presentation, which was uh, issued in June. And um, it was, uh, I think the closing happened in August, the closing of the bid happened in August. Now government is going through a process of e evaluating this bid. Basically this was a request for information, most importantly for <clears throat> understanding the cost because government has to understand how much it will cost and over and above the cost they are looking for information on the the financing models because as you know there's quite a number of uh, <clears throat> um, there's quite a number of financing models there's the build operate and transfer models there is government guarantees you know there is uh, strategic partnerships such as the, the, the Rosatom in Russia, the model of the Rosatom in Russia and so on. So government is uh, going to evaluate the <clears throat> bits that they have received in as far as this RFI is concerned and see if um, the, 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 the taste, the, if they have the appetite really to engage based on the costs and the attractiveness of the financing models. Thank you. Our next question comes from uh, Sego Maloko. And the question is as follows. Since it has been a long time since we licensed a nuclear facility in South Africa, could you please provide an indication on our readiness in licensing the proposed uh, 2,500 megawatt nuclear power plant and a new mm -hmm. research reactor and possibly a multi-purpose reactor? That's a very good one, Lesejo. Uh, <clears throat> It is important that we realize that the nuclear build, the nuclear new build in South Africa was mooted as far back as 2008, way before I joined the National Nuclear Regulator. At that point in time, the regulator took steps to prepare itself for the eventual licensing of a new nuclear build. The, the, the new build again was brought on board in 20. 12, 2013, after I had joined, we further put a lot of investing in uh, capacity building for the regulator to ensure that we'll be able to do that. It was since again postponed, now it has come back again. So you can imagine that we have over some time gained enough uh, 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 space to build our capability. That's one, but secondly, the reason why we engage in a lot of bilateral agreements with uh, some very experienced nuclear regulators such as the USNRC and Stuk in Finland, for example, is precisely because those people and the Chinese and, and, and uh, 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 um, the regulator in, in Russia, Rostek Nazor, is precisely because those people are currently building nuclear power plants and therefore they have real-time experience of licensing such huge projects. So we were going to latch into those partnerships and bilateral agreements to enable us to harvest the experience and to also, where possible, uh, engage some of their staff where needs be in our regulatory and, and licensing processes. And thirdly, we are allowed by law to engage so-called technical support organization, TSOs, such as, for example, the NCSU, such as uh, the VTT in Finland, such as uh, 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 um, the, the, the IRSN, IRSN, IRSN in France, we are allowed by law to engage such technical support organizations to augment regulatory capacity in the case where we are lacking. So 
with those three points that I've just mentioned, I believe that we are well poised to license a small, a small scale 2,500 megawatts uh, project, new build project. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to do two more questions. Uh, the, two, the next two questions I'm going to try to mash together um, because you had partially answered one uh, previously already. Um, Pascal asks, uh, what is the status of high temperature gas reactor activities? Then there's also a question regarding the, um, the, the what's the, the, the status of, you mentioned that light water reactors are going to be the near term reactor builds in South Africa. Where does that leave the domestic, uh, such as pebble bed reactor technology? Yes. <clears throat> so the, the IRP that I spoke about specifically also mentioned accommodation of small modular reactors. Now, as you know, small modular reactors uh, are a mixed bag. You have light water cooled ones and you have gas cooled ones. Gas cooled reactors, we know, <clears throat> South Africa has pursued the pebble bed reactor project, but our friends in China uh, are almost uh, commissioning uh, a pebble bed reactor um, of uh, 200 megawatts thermal per unit, which gives, which makes two, which is a two, two unit uh, uh, plant in China. Now, with that said, the question of accommodating small modular reactors as part of the nuclear new build is not off the table. So the 2,500 megawatts may well be that 1,000 megawatts, sorry, 2,000 megawatts of that may actually be the, low, the, the large established light water reactors and 500 megawatts may actually be allocated to small modular reactors. And small modular reactors can also be high temperature gas cooled reactors. We have a huge a treasure trove of experience um, on uh, the design and uh, <coughs> licensing of uh, high of high temperature gas cooled reactors, and we that option is not off the table as far as government is concerned. Thank you. We have two more quick questions to go through real quick. Lots of questions today. This is great. Um, usually the Zoom meeting are less questions, but that is not the case today. This is nice to see. Um, Patrick uh, Tabeka asks, how are mining companies held responsible for the environmental contamination coming from old waste dumps and how big is the problem? The problem is huge, first and foremost. And um, it is very problematic, uh, Patrick, because it, it, it is a situation where these sites are almost ownerless, so to speak. People have, came, have come in, mined the gold, and left the sites unrehabilitated. Now that is, has become a burden of government, so to speak. Now we are working closely with our mining regulation counterparts to deal with so-called contaminated site, legacy sites and contaminated sites. In fact, in 2018, uh, at the NNR, I started a unit, <coughs> that, a unit that is called uh, unit responsible for regulation of contaminated legacy and ownerless sites. Now, through these units, we try to work with government entities such as Mintech to rehabilitate these sites and also to try as much as possible to find the owners wherever they may be to be responsible for the cost of rehabilitation. As you can imagine, it is not an easy task. Some of those, of those companies are, are, are insolvent. Some of them have ceased to exist. Some of them have since moved overseas. So it is a huge problem and it continues to expose our people to undue radiation exposures, especially in, in the poorest uh, of the poor areas. So that is a problem. Thank you. Our last question for today, I know we're a few minutes over, but uh, this is a, a question from one of our faculty, uh, uh, Sir uh, Mihai Daikanisa. Um, 
And the question is as follows. In the United States, probabilistic risk assessments are fundamental to the regulatory infrastructure of the reactor oversight process, particularly when used in the significance determination process for regulators to assess and classify the degree to which various events might impact plant safety. Also for plant operators, probabilistic risk assessment technologies are fundamental for meeting regulatory requirements while still improving plant operational efficiencies. So the question is, what is the current status of risk-informed regulations and probabilistic risk assessments applications in South Africa? Well, you, you will be surprised to know that our forebearers in the regulator, <coughs> uh, when it started many years ago, insisted on Quebec being licensed using the probabilistic uh, safety assessments, the PRA, P, PSA, PRA. Uh, basis. So we are one of the forerunners in that space and it is firmly part of our requirements that uh, licensees must demonstrate that they have conducted the, 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 the PRA in all levels, uh, level one, level two, level three, and uh, use that as the basis for their submissions for licensing. So it is firmly part of our <coughs> regulatory uh, DNA, so to speak. Great. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I know we've run a little bit over, so I don't see any other questions coming up on the chat or with any hands raised. So uh, at this time, I would like to uh, um, thank you for your wonderful presentation and a uh, very full uh, Q&A, which is always good to see. Um, and uh, look forward to getting to meet you face to face sometime. Uh, was nice, but I imagine getting to sit in the same room with you would be even better. So thank you very much for your time and thank everyone else for all of your attention today during the seminar. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. I would like to add that we have been planning with Bismarck for him to visit NC State and it will happen in near future. Thank you, Bismarck. Thank you on behalf of the department. Great uh, to see all of you.